Okay, then uh, um, I am very, very happy to uh, uh, introduce uh, Felix Lezebnik from the University of Delaware. Um, he was, I would say, one of my advisors when I was there. So um, it's really great to uh, hear his voice again. And uh, he's going to tell us today about uh, graphs without short cycles and asymmetric lifts. So uh, take us away, Felix. Thank you very much, Stephen. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the invitation. Again, sorry that uh, you cannot see me. But uh, as long as you can see the slides, that's, that's the most important. OK, the title of my talk is Graph Without Short Cycle and Asymmetric Lifts. But uh, most of the talk, um, I will uh, just uh, do some survey. And uh, you will see many pictures, actually. Uh, so I want just to say that. Uh, uh, everything I mentioned and more uh, is presented in these two surveys. One is this one, 202 with Boulder, and another is with uh, Shuin Sang and Ye Wong in 17. Uh, the last paper is on, uh, uh, this paper is on archive and it's submitted. And it has, uh, it has kind of uh, uh, survey from 17 to, to, to 21, whatever happened. And uh, all right, so let me begin. So motivation uh, for this talk is this. Motivation will be constructing new generalized foregone. Uh, I will tell you immediately that we did not succeed yet in doing that. But that's the main motivation and many problems I have been working lately uh, on and off uh, uh, really, uh, these problems came from these attempts. Uh, another smaller things are lifts that result in graph with small automorphism groups and uh, the need of three variables for defining some algebraic graphs. So that will become clear after I start. Okay, uh, so first of all, what are generalized um, uh, n guns? So suppose n and s are integers, n is at least two, s is at least one, a generalized n gun of order s is a bipartite s plus one regular graph of diameter n and yours 2n. So this definition, so it's bipartite graph, s plus one regular with diameter n and girls 2n. This definition is a little restrictive. In many books, generalized polygons are defined as by regular bipartite graphs. So vertices on one partition have degree, say, um, T plus one and on another S plus one. But for our purposes, that will be the definition. So they will be regular bipartite graphs uh, with this diameter and this uh, girls. Uh, so for S equals one and N is at least two, the usual even cycle is, uh, gives you an example of that. And if N is two, so diameter is two and girls is four, then complete bipartite graph uh, uh, gives us example for arbitrary S. But when S is at least two and N is at least three, then uh, it's not easy to construct such graphs. And uh, uh, so there are only three values of N for which uh, uh, they constructed. And they were constructed by uh, Jacques Tietz in 1959. And uh, he proved that uh, they exist for each prime power S uh, for n equals three, four, and nine. So that's the result of this. Uh, three got, so three, four, and uh, three, four, and uh, six, yeah. Uh, so for three, three guns, it, it, these are bipartite graphs, which are which have diameters three and girl six. They are exactly uh, point incident graphs of uh, projective planes of order S. So they, of course, were known before Tietz, but these are, in his language, generalized three guns. And uh, if degree, if order is S plus one, yeah, if order is S, so degree is S plus one, they have so many uh, vertices in each partition and uh, the asymptotic uh, for the number of edges in terms of number of vertices becomes this uh, when v goes to infinity. Uh, generalized foregons are a little much less known. 
And uh, again, their analysis, uh, if diameter four and girls eight, you can count that there will be so many points and lines. And then, you know, the asymptotic for the number of edges in terms of vertices is this. And generalized hexagon of order S will have uh, in each partition so many uh, vertices, diameter six, girls 12. And uh, that will be the asymptotic for the number of edges. Now, here is Jacques Tietz. Uh, uh, he um, uh, introduced this notion uh, and this language of incident structure when he studied uh, simple groups. Uh, later, he developed it into the theory of building, which uses this type of terminology of incidents. Uh, he did it in the following way. So suppose we have a finite group and we have two subgroups. P1 and P2. We can define the following bipartite graph or incident geometry. So take as a set of points, say all left co-sets of G with respect to subgroup P1 and uh, another set will be uh, all the uh, co-sets with respect to P2. So these are our set of vertices. And uh, you join vertex in one partition with the vertex of another partition, one call set with another, if their uh, set theoretic intersection is not empty. So that's the definition. Now, the, this can be done for every group and you will get nice graph with a lot of symmetry. So this is a huge uh, source of examples. But if you apply this to some special groups, which are called final rank two simple Chevrolet groups of Lie type and uh, to very special subgroups of them, which are called maximum parabolics, then the graphs you obtain by partite graphs will be very nice. And actually they will be exactly generalized three guns, four guns and six guns. So that's how uh, they appeared you know, in the work of, of Tietz. Now, uh, about five years later, uh, Feit and Higman published a great theorem. They, they uh, prove that there are no other generalized N guns. So N guns, if N is not three, four and six, we cannot have a generalized N gun. So they just don't exist. Again, I, if you uh, used to generalize the polygons in some other setting, I, I, I repeat that we have a uh, restricted definition. For us, they are uh, just regular graphs. Uh, uh, every point has the same degree as plus one. So in this uh, regard, that's what that, um, their theorem says. And uh, the proof of the theorem was the first really non-trivial and beautiful application of uh, spectral techniques. It's, uh, this proof is not well known, it's published of course, but um, it takes time to get through it. The original proof I think is harder. Uh, the proof I like more, uh, for example, can be read in the book uh, by Brouwer, Cohen, and Neumeier, and um, uh, there is a proof. So that was uh, something. So that's at this time I stop about generalized end guns, and I will uh, try to uh, uh, formulate another motivation for uh, this type of graphs. And they come from Turan type problems. Of course, uh, probably everyone knows uh, what Turan numbers are. So if we have um, H, G, B graphs and H is a subgraph, if a uh, set of vertices is subset of set of vertices of, and set, set of edges of H is subset of uh, set of edges. And we will say that if G contains no subgraph isomorphic to H, we will call it H3 and write that. And then, you know, we can introduce uh, this function or number. So uh, for uh, V and H, uh, we consider the maximum number of edges in a graph on V vertices, which is H free. So among all graphs on V vertices, which are H free, we take graphs with the largest number of edges. And similarly, when we uh, have a family of graphs, script H, uh, then uh, we introduce uh, a similar function, uh, uh, which uh, is the greatest number of edges in a graph on V vertices, which contain none, which uh, contains none of the graphs from this family script edge. Uh, 
H. So when V and H are fixed, these are numbers and they're called Turan numbers. So when V changes, Turan function. So maybe I will skip this slide for a moment. Uh, these are examples of Turan numbers, but uh, I interrupt me please anytime. If someone uh, not very familiar with uh, uh, Turan uh, uh, numbers that I can, copy, uh, I can comment a little bit more, but since it's recorded, you can just see. So they're not known well uh, for many, many H. Uh, for example, C8 is one of the first uh, example where uh, there is no even magnitude known. Uh, in many other cases, magnitude may be known or inequalities for these numbers are uh, present, but um, exact results are very, very rare here. Uh, so the main theorem of Turan um, 41 was that uh, if you forbid complete graph on R vertices, then among goal graphs on the edges, the multipartite uh, Turan graph, r partite Turan graph is the best construction and it gives so many edges. Then Erdős Stone, you know, generalized this for arbitrary graph H. And uh, they express, you know, the main term in asymptotic uh, by using chromatic number of H psi. Then, you know, in 20 years, it was a little generalized, but by Erdős and Shimanovich when we had forbidden family of graphs. And uh, then you just pick the smallest chromatic number and this uh, number uh, governs the coefficient in this asymptotic. So it's V squared times a number. But uh, when uh, uh, chromatic number of forbidden graph is two, like even cycle or complete bipartite graph or, or a tree, then uh, this formula just gives little o of v square because when you divide by v square, you will get here zero. So the limit will be zero. So little o of v square, uh, it's not a very precise information and uh, people try to improve this. Uh, and this type of problems where a forbidden graph is bipartite or at least one forbidden graph is bipartite, they are called degenerate Turan type problems. And uh, there is a nice big survey by Furedi and Shimanovich and, uh, in 2013. So that's Turan, Paul Erdős, Arthur Stone, uh, Zoltan Furedi, Mikla Shimanovich. Now, suppose case fixed uh, positive integer and what can be said about uh, these two numbers? How are they compared? Of course, you know, uh, this number is smaller than this number because you forbid much more. So you could put less edges on V vertices. So this number is less. Actually, it will be always strictly less. Uh, equalities here are, uh, won't happen. But, but in all examples known, uh, when the uh, magnitude as a function of V is known of these uh, numbers, that the magnitude is the same, coefficients only change and coefficient may depend on K. So this is a very nice open question uh, that if we consider the ratio of this number to this, is it possible to uh, bound it from below by a positive constant, depending on K of course. So that's a very nice question. Do these numbers have the same magnitude or not? And as far as I know, it's still open. Now about the upper bounds. The upper bound here uh, come from the uh, unpublished result of Erdős and uh, result of Bundy and Shimanovich who really proved a little bit more than that. But that's the upper bound. It's constant dependent on K, V to the power one plus one over K. Uh, so of course, having this upper bound, people try to construct lower bound for say this number with uh, of the same magnitude. And that was hard. So simple probabilistic argument gives exponent instead of one plus in lower bound, it will be this. Then a little better probabilistic argument uh, uh, gives you a little bit greater exponent in the lower bound. 
Then, you know, Margulis, Lubotsky, Philip Sarnak, independently, Margulis and Lubotsky, Philip Sarnak, they constructed graphs such that, um, you know, the exponent uh, in the power of V is one plus two thirds times one over K roughly. Here it's one over K here, and this is roughly one plus two thirds one over K. And uh, that was explicit construction. And you know, it's famous Ramanujan graphs. Um, with Ustibenko, uh, we uh, could um, do explicitly a little bit better than, uh, than this probabilistic argument of Erdős, but it was constant here is one half times one over k, so it's worse than that. But uh, lately with uh, Ustibenko and Volder, we could uh, get two thirds times one over k, but we have a little bit better here. Epsilon here is uh, zero or one. So our bound is better than uh, bounds of Margulis and Lubotsky, Philip Sarnak. And, and uh, it was obtained by the techniques I will be described a little bit later. So these are about lower bounds. Now, that's Andrian Bondi, whose picture you haven't seen yet. And that's Margulis, Lubotsky, Phillips, and Sarnak. So these are people who worked on that. That's Vasily Ustimenka, and that's Andrew Volder. Now, again, so let's again look at this upper bound. So one question is, uh, for which k there is a lower bound uh, which uh, matches in magnitude this upper bound? You see, because what we did here, what we did here, uh, we talked here about general bound, the ones which exist for every K, but for some particular K, uh, the lower bound can be better. So, so we, if we try to match this, then uh, exactly these graphs, which we touched generalized uh, three gun, four gun and six gun, they really provide uh, the same magnitude as the upper bound. So for k equals two, for k equals three, and for k equals uh, six. So they are kind of give you uh, magnitude wise uh, the best um, lower bound. Uh, constant is, uh, constants are not matched here. The only thing when constant is, uh, is, is known that's um, when k is two, so, but um, it still doesn't match, sorry. If you just forbid c4, then it's known. But if you forbid c3 and c4, it's not known. The upper bound, constant and upper bound, when you forbid c3, c4 in the, in the lower bound, they are different constant, but one, by the multiple one over square root of two. Or, so, so uh, I will not uh, give you examples of projective plane, but uh, of course, uh, someone, you know, we gave definition of the foregun, but uh, what is foregun? At least one example. And it's not that easy to, uh, to, 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 uh, to write and analyze. Uh, for QR, for example, only foregun is known. And that is, you know, something very, very different from three guns. For three guns, projective planes, if, order of projective plane is prime power, which is not prime and at least nine, then usually there are many, many non-isomorphic projective planes. So the extremal constructions for uh, graphs, uh, you know, without um, uh, C3, C4 and C5 uh, are uh, non-isomorphic graphs. They are all, you know, Q plus one regular, all have diameter three and girl six, but they are not isomorphic. On the other hand, only one for gun is known. And it's description uh, due to Clark Benson, and that's the description. So you take a projective uh, four dimensional space or the same as, you know, usual vector space of dimension five over FQ, and you consider, uh, uh, five uh, tuples uh, and you identify the proportional one, 
a linear one. So you, you obtain this. So you can think that, you know, that's the definition. That's the definition. So you take a vector which satisfies this condition. You span a line. So points in this uh, geometry will be um, one dimensional subspaces, lines uh, uh, in uh, FQ5. And uh, lines will be two dimensional uh, subspaces such that all vectors satisfy this. So they are called totally isotropic. So it means every vector satisfies this, but it's two dimensional. So, and the adjacency is by containment. This seem to be not bad description, but um, you know, it's high dimensional and, uh, um, and uh, it's known that if you go to another non-singular quadric, uh, then all of them will be projectively equivalent. So you will not get a new generalized foregone. Now, now, some of you may remember that actually there are two. There is this uh, Q4 and there is another one, which very often is written as WQ, symplectic one. As geometries, they are not isomorphic. One is um, uh, dual of another, but as bipartite graphs and our definition for generalized and Ganza in terms of graphs, they are isomorphic. So really there is only one infinite series of generalized foregrounds. And that's, you know, was uh, motivation just after, you know, we learned about this and um, actually Ustimenka tried to do this even before we started working with him. He tried to construct new generalized foregrounds. But that's the striking difference. You know, here you have infinitely many extremal objects and here you have, you have essentially only one infinite series. Now, Clark Benson uh, was a graduate student of uh, Walter Tate at, at Cornell at that time. And uh, uh, he was interested in this problem uh, because uh, uh, there Andrew Gleason uh, pointed out to him that probably these generalized four guns are related to minimal graphs, which were introduced by Tart, you know, with those Moore bounds. Bound. And um, so uh, Benson really was interested to describe those minimal graphs. And uh, so they are, you know, called cages now. They are uh, yours eight, uh, Q plus one regular graphs on the smallest possible number of vertices. So that's minimal. So that uh, was motivation for ben Benson. But of course, fight, you know, uh, work with group theoretic description of this uh, generalized foregone. So that was probably another way just to present it without any group theory. And that's what it is. Uh, all right, all right. Uh, so you see there are not many generalized uh, n-guns. They exist only for n equals three, four, and six. Now, so what we will consider uh, will exist in much greater uh, number. They will, uh, we will call them at the beginning biofine parts of generalized N-GAN. What are biofine parts? Uh, so suppose you have a generalized N-GAN, that's bipartite graph, and uh, you pick an edge x, y, and you remove this edge from the graph and you remove all vertices that are at distance at most n minus one from both x and y. So you are in n-gun, it's a bipartite graph, you pick an edge and then you consider all vertices which are at the distance at most n minus one from x and y. It's very easy to understand that what uh, you really remove uh, edge and all those vertices, you are removing a spanning tree uh, of generalized n-gun. There will be no cycles there because the shortest cycle has lengths to n. And uh, really you will be removing so many vertices in each partition. So what will be left in each partition will be this number of vertices. And what you will obtain is easy to argue will be a bipartite graph. Each partition will have so many vertices. That's exactly as many in magnitude that in the whole generalized n-gun because what you remove, you know, has smaller um, 
folder. And the diameter will go up. Diameter will become n plus one. But the girl certainly, because it's a subgraph, the uh, girl cannot become less, but it really will still be 2n. So you will not affect the girls by removing this spanning tree from it. Now, when you uh, again take this kind of simpler graph a little bit, it's S regular. Then you compute that the number asymptotic for the number of edges in terms of number of vertices is as good as the, for the whole generalized m -gun. So from the point of view of Turan uh, theory, uh, studying uh, these big subgraphs uh, a little bit easier than the studying the whole generalized uh, m -gun. So that's uh, by a fine parts are as good actually as the whole object for the Turan type problems. Now, I did not give you definition of generalized six gun and I didn't do it because it's not easy. It's really messy. Uh, it can be done only also by using this form, but when you define lines, it, it's really messy. It's all in Benson's paper. Uh, right. So um, yeah, here I couldn't find a picture of Benson. Sorry, but he worked at University of Arizona after he graduated for many years. Now, what you see here will be a description of this biofine part. So graphs which are presented here in blue are really biofine parts of generalized three gun and generalized four gun. Uh, since there are many generalized three guns, this is I, I pick just this classical one. That's projective plane uh, of order Q. So it's made, it's a bipartite graph. So one partition points, these are one dimensional subspace, subspaces in the three dimensional space over F Q and lines will be two dimensional subspaces in the same space. And the uh, condition uh, of adjacency is by containment. So it turns out it's very easy to check that that's the description of uh, this biofine part of classical projective plane. So it has Q square points and Q square lines and a point and a line are joined by an edge only if this relation holds. So it's easy to explain that that's exactly what happens when you do this procedure of going to buy a fine part in projective plane. The girls will be six. If I take, yeah, and here I wrote the by a fine part uh, because you know in this graph, if you consider Lady graph or point line bipartite graph of this uh, PG to Q of this geometry, uh, it's edge transitive. So it doesn't matter what edge you take. Uh, so that's why D by a fine part in this particular. Now, when you take this particular uh, generalized quadrangle, what we saw described by Benson, also it can be explained that as bipartite graph, it's edge transitive. So here also, when you uh, construct by a fine part, there will be only one. In general, if you take projective plane, uh, which is not flag transitive, uh, then uh, it depends what you are left with after you delete different edges. The result should not be isomorphic. Right, but here they are. Now, and this, no matter what edge you take, that will be the description of this by a fine part. So how does it work? Uh, you know, with, uh, there, it's a foregun, so it will be q cube vertices in each partition. Each partition can be thought as a three-dimensional vector space over F. And um, we take a point and we join it to the line. If the following two condition hold, the sum of the second coordinate of a point in a line is product of the first, and the sum of the third is product of the first coordinate of a line and second coordinate of a point. So this is a very simple description for the biofine part of the generalized foreground. I did not give you any model or uh, example of generalized six gun, but it exists and it exists only one. And uh, 
if you write uh, its by a fine part, it will look like this. It will look like this. It will be Gerst round. So there is some similarity in the way here they are presented. Uh, people believe that there is only one generalized hexagon, but about generalized uh, quadrangle uh, or foregun, uh, opinions differ. Some people believe that there is no other than this one for rat Q. Q is out here, by the way, sorry. And uh, other people think that there must be more, but that's what it is. Another thing which uh, will be useful to us. So uh, suppose we have two graphs, H1 and H2. Uh, and suppose phi will be a function from set of vertices of the second graph to the set of vertices of the first graph, such that every edge x, y will be mapped to the edge. So um, then phi is called the homomorphism from h2 to h1, and we will write it h2 maps to h1. So phi is homomorphism. So suppose uh, we have a homomorphism from h2 to h1, and suppose it's surjective. So the image uh, will be the whole set of vertices v1. And suppose that for every vertex v in v2, or every vertex of graph h2, the restriction of phi to the neighborhood of v in h2 is bijection onto the neighborhood of phi of v in h1. Then phi is called a covering. And uh, H2 in this case called the cover, the cover of H1, or it's called a lift of H1. So, so similarly to topology, it's just local homeomorphism. So that's, uh, that's what happens uh, for covering the map. Um, example, suppose here you have two graphs and um, H and C, C stands just for cover. So C really, is a lift of H, C covers H. To see this, uh, these colors have nothing to do with graph coloring. It's just um, to see, you know, uh, if you take graph C, then these two yellow vertices will map to this yellow, these two red will map to this, blue to blue and so forth. You can easily check, uh, looking carefully, that uh, what you get will be, uh, will be a covering map when vertices of the same color are mapped here. What is interest, or this will be lift, this graph, you know, this graph C will be lift of this graph H. It's interesting that this triangle, you know, uh, becomes a, a set of two triangles, but this triangle becomes a six cycle. So this is a very simple example, which shows that lift can destroy a cycle. So it was this triangle, now you have this, and that's uh, a longer cycle. So lift can map cycles to longer cycles. And uh, uh, terminology, when you know you have the covering map and U is the vertex of V1 of this graph, then phi minus one of U is called the fiber of U in H2. And if all fibers have the same cardinality R, then we say that H2 is really a R lift of H1. So that's our lift of H1. And here we come to these constructions of biofine part of generalized polygons. So I told, yeah, we said that this is, um, this graph H1 here is a biofine part of the classical projective plane. And this is the biofine part of the generalized foregone. You see that the first equation is the same here. And actually uh, the second graph is Q lift of the first graph for the very simple reason. Uh, if you consider set of vertices of this graph H2, it will be this P3 union with L3. These are two um, three dimensional vector spaces over FQ. And here the union of two dimensional vector spaces over FQ. And consider this map on this set of vertices, just every vertex, you know, is truncated by 
just erase the last coordinate. So point will x, y, z will go to point x, y, and line x, y, z will go to line x, y. And you can very easily see that this will be a covering map. And you can very easily see that what you get will be a Q-lift. So this graph is Q-lift. Um, I didn't uh, explain this yet, but these graphs are Q-regular. That's uh, show, uh, of course, that follows, you know, from the, uh, from the definition of biofine parts because we take out a tree there, but, um, uh, another way to see it is, is this, that they are few regular graphs. Just take a vertex and how many neighbors does it have? To construct a neighbor of this vertex, we use these two equations. We give L1 an arbitrary value. That, you know, will allow us to compute L2 uniquely. Now, if we know L1 and L2, it will allow us to compute L3 uniquely because P1, P2, and P3 is fixed as a fixed point and we count in neighbors. So choice of L1, any choice of L1 create exactly one neighbor. And there are Q choices for L1, that's why there are Q neighbors. Absolutely the same as here. And this, you know, local isomorphism is easy to check because the choice of the first coordinate of a neighbor defines this neighbor completely. So that's, you know, why this will be a Q. And you know, this Q-lift is remarkable. The girth of this graph is six, and there are many, many six cycles in this graph. But the girth of this graph is eight, it's generalized code, part of generalized code. So every six cycle you can find in this graph will be destroyed under this lift, will be destroyed under this lift. It has to be checked, it's, uh, but it's really just trivial, trivial verification with this equations of adjacency. There are no six cycles here, you can check. And here, there are millions of six cycles. All right, now this scheme can be generalized. Here, I will take just f of p1 l1, any function of two variables here. And I will construct graph gamma qf, f is defining function. And here I can start with two functions, f and g, and I can construct, you know, a graph like that. Again, again, this graph will be Q regular. You know, if you fix point P1, P2, P3, and then you give L1 any value, then L2 and L3 will be uniquely computed after that. So it's Q regular graph. And again, this uh, truncation of the third coordinate gives you, gives you the covering map from bigger to smaller. So how can one try to construct new generalized polygons? Okay, start it like you had before, but instead of the second equation, write something, you know, uh, more general, because we know that P1L2 works here, but you can take any function. And you just, the only thing you want is to get your say. Suppose you will get your say, then you will try to attach the uh, tree. We believe it's easy to do. But no one could, you know, construct a graph of yours eight by using function g, which is not isomorphic to the graph which has p one l two here. So, so no one could still do it, and no one could prove that this doesn't exist. Of course, having four variables here, it's uh, not needed. You see, because from the first equation, L2 can be written in terms of P1, L1, and P2. So really there are three variables here. Uh, therefore, I will just rewrite it in this way. And that's what uh, uh, I was doing and other people were doing, trying to find this function G to get girls eight with the hope if we get this, then probably attaching three will be easy after that and we could get a new generalized foregone. So far, we couldn't do it. What was great about this problem, and a lot of computer uh, simulation was uh, done, still, you know, with computers, I think much more can be done than what we did. But what is interesting here, you try to find a graph in some, uh, G in some simple form and check it, and you get very interesting problems just problems you want to work on immediately. You want to forget, you know, the original question which led to that problem and just work on that. And I will show you some of it. Uh, so that's the status. Now, 
no such function g has been found so far. Now, but there is another thing here. When I when you look at these graphs, uh, at these graphs, you see this is q the same as here. Uh, the first uh, equation has p one l one on the right. The second has uh, g g sub one. And here the same P1L1, so it's a pi fine part of projective plane, and that's G2. So we consider two lifts of the pi fine part of projective plane. We consider two lifts. And, uh, and uh, if G1 is not G2, they can be isomorphic. That's a big thing, you know. For example, these graphs, which one, two, three, four, five, they are all isomorphic. You see, they all, I underline this P1L1, they are all lifts of this biofine part of projective plane, of the classical project. But these equations, this has three variables, this has two variables, this has two variables, this has actually only P1L1, and um, only P1L1 is sufficient to write that graph. So what, uh, it's, not easy, it's not hard to prove at all. So when we are here, when we are here and we have this generalized by fine part of generalized foregun, instead of P1L2, I can write P1L1 square and you will get isomorphic graph. It's easy to check. It's not obvious, but it's easy to check, to prove, to prove. So functions can, you know, be very, very uh, crazy looking and graphs can be isomorphic. So maybe, you know, this suggestion, because there is one classical generalized foregun for which biofine parts can be written only in terms of P1L1. Then the question is maybe instead of taking this function G of three variables, maybe we can just uh, take um, function H of two variables in the second equation of P1L1 and try, you know, even, you know, this is smaller class, of course, than class of functions of three variables. It's contained in that. But um, that was natural to try. And again, we couldn't find such function H, but we couldn't prove that uh, it does not exist. And um, uh, that, you know, led to another question. Given this graph, And here, the second equation is written by using P1 and one P2. Is it possible to find function of two variables such that this graph with three will be isomorphic to this graph with, you know, having H here uh, for sufficiently large, for sufficiently large Q. So in some sense, is it needed to have three variables in this graph? The expected answer is no, because if you count how many functions of three variables are from you know, FQ to FQ, that's the number. And here it's much smaller number. So probably there are Gs you know, for which you cannot find H, but uh, somehow we couldn't make this you know, counting argument clear. Uh, so what parameters really distinguish this graph if you have only two? here and if you have three variables here. And it turns out that um, one of the best parameters for us uh, turned out to be a group of automorphism. And uh, this graph, which uh, has only two variables in the second equation, will have uh, this group as a subgroup. So that's additive group of vector space of dimension two. But this graph, when you have three, it may not have this uh, uh, type of subgroups. So that was the, and we uh, uh, found this really by using computers. No, this was clear that, you know, but uh, how to find a graph which has one property, but not another, that was not clear, explicit example. Why this is true? Because, you know, if you take graph, this graph, when the second equation has only two variables, uh, it should be comma here, P1 comma L1. Then, um, then um, this will be an automorphism. Every so fix A and B two elements of the field. Add A to P two, add B to P three, 
and then subtract A from L2 and subtract B from. Now, when you add second coordinate, it's the same as it was, and it's the same as it was, but the right hand sides are using only first coordinate. So there should be comma here between P1 and M1. So that's obvious. That's obvious that if you have this graph, that it must contain this group. So in particular, Q square might has to divide the order of this graph. But when you have three, and here two and three correspond to number of variables, then uh, you can easily say that this is an automorphism. Uh, but you cannot add constant to P2 and subtract it from L2 because you know P2 will be substituted in, inside of function G, and it may not work. You uh, so so, and often it doesn't. Therefore, uh, this graph for sure has only one. Uh, has smaller subgroup. It will be uh, this F sub Q here, and uh, Q divides this. Okay. All right. So sometimes a Q lift of a graph has larger order of automorphism group than the graph. Q lift of a graph, uh, you, we don't need this one, has larger order. For example, if you start with uh, prime field of P elements, then if you just analyze automorphism group of biofine part of projective plane, it's not too hard to see that that's the answer. But when you lift it, actually the number is bigger. P is odd. Uh, actually every automorphism of this graph can be lifted to the automorphism of this graph. Plus this graph will have a little bit more automorphisms. So that's, uh, so the group can grow when you lift. On the other hand, the group can become much smaller. And we take the same biofine part of uh, classical projective plane, but function G is, you know, this. And uh, now we can prove that the automorphism group of this graph is small. This graph appeared in the uh, dissertation of Ben Nassau. And, um, but he couldn't prove that um, uh, this graph has uh, only P automorphism. So this was done by uh, Taranchuk and myself. And the theorem is this. If P is one mod three, then group of automorphism of this graph R, R stands for rigid, it's small. You see, we have to have those P, P automorphism, that's addition on the third coordinate. But that's inevitable from the, this type of construction. We will have them. But uh, we don't have any other automorphisms. And uh, because of that, because of that, the, because of this, uh, the order of this group is divisible by P, but not P square. So it cannot be of this type. It cannot be of this type. So this graph, you know, has function which has three variables, but uh, it cannot be rewritten as a function which has two variables, which is not surprising, as I said, because, uh, but this is explicit. And what was another not surprising that it was hard to prove. We checked it for all prime powers even uh, up to 41. And uh, program shows that uh, the group automorphism has only P elements. So they are only trivial automorphisms, those translations of the second, third coordinate. But uh, this graph, uh, uh, but the proof was not easy. And uh, I mentioned the paper already, it's on archive, and it's a little technical. But the idea of the proof is to show that this graph, there, is, there are point lines. There are two very special lines. And you uh, take this uh, three neighborhood of a line, in this bipartite graph. And there are two lines, specific lines, such that one line has three neighborhood larger than any other line, and second line has second largest than any other line. So these are very two special lines. So every automorphism must map them to, to themselves because they are winners, you know, they are absolute winners, those two lines. But having only two lines fixed by automorphism is was is not enough to say that you know you, you can fix everything else. And um, that was uh, not easy proof. Um, so 
of, of, so that, that's what I want to say. That's Benjamin Nasser and that's Vladislav Taranchuk. Now, I, I'm saying now open problems and I will finish. Uh, I was saying that uh, the, the, the whole this subject is great fun because you get problems you never kind of think about formulating. Uh, of course, one main problem is this. Just can we lift this classical plane to uh, something to uh, a graph of your state? Can we make it by Q-lift? That's a big question. It's not answered and we cannot answer them all. But trying different, you know, H's usually to prove that we cannot, we cannot. We came to some questions about uh, permutation polynomial. So suppose F is a function uh, from FQ to FQ and uh, K be positive integer, you can consider this function. And uh, the question is when it's bijection, it's very easy to check that if K divides Q, meaning that K is power of P, then it's a bijection. But if K doesn't divide Q, it's not a bijection. And we couldn't prove it. We tried very hard. And I ask, you know, all people who do, um, uh, who work in finite fields and with uh, permutation polynomials, and it's still open. So, and I really spend a lot of time on that. Another function is this. This function is a little prettier, the first one, because if you look at its structure, it's what is written here is, a uh, discrete derivative of monomial x to the k. So you take monomial and you multiply it by its derivative. So it's like y times y prime. It's not by design, it just turned out this when we studied some six cycles so in some class. So that's, you know, kind of, and there are many questions of this type. Another big question is this, suppose you go to four dimensional vector spaces as your points and lines, and you want to find functions f2, f3, f4, two variables, four variables, six variables, such that when you consider this graph, it will have no eight cycle. If you manage to do this, then you will settle, you know, this 60 plus year old question. What is the Turan number of the eight cycle? Because in this graph, the asymptotic of the number of edges as function of number of vertices, precisely this. It will be Q regular graph. That will be this. So, so far we, I cannot do it and other people who try could not do it. That, uh, and what is interesting here is that you try different things and it doesn't work, doesn't work, doesn't work. But even to show that it doesn't work for some very, very particular functions, these are very enjoyable problems. So, but of course it's interesting whether it, they exist or not. But that's the closest idea I have, for example, attacking this question. I have no other ideas how such graph can be uh, constructed, but this, you know, didn't work. Kodish uh, and Cronin, Tal and Wong, uh, very re recently just came to this question, which I wanted to present to you. They submitted the paper. Now, instead of finite field, take real numbers. So these are exactly the same graphs as we discussed before. Uh, they have two equations. The first equation, P2 plus L2 equals that, and P3 plus L3 equals that. But now we do it over real numbers. So graphs are infinite. And the question is, are these graphs isomorphic? When you have L1 square here and L1 to the fourth. Over complex numbers, they are not. Over finite fields, they are not. But over reals, uh, we cannot prove it. And we cannot understand really what, uh, uh, we, I say, they, they, that's their problem. They came up with this question, but I tried a little. Uh, what, so these are infinite bipartite graphs, cardinal, uh, just, uh, uh, valency is continuum, of course. And uh, what, uh, yeah, they, they have, uh, uh, both of them have uh, four cycles. So they are not graph, you know, they, so all these graphs, no, not four cycles, six cycles, I'm sorry. They cannot have four cycles because they begin with projective plane and that is lift of that. So uh, projective plane has no four cycles. So. So that is the question. So these are these three young men who came up with this 
very interesting question. They could answer some other questions over R. And then uh, uh, the last problem, uh, that's the old problem of uh, Dominique Decaine and Lassie Seke. And that problem to study this number over the family of all bipartite graphs with partitions of size M and M. Lassie, do you remember this problem? Yeah. So uh, here, here we want to find bipartite graphs with uh, partitions of size M and N that maximize the number of edges if we don't have C4 and C6. So these, th these are, this is family of all bipartite graphs with this. In particular, when M is uh, this, uh, Erdős thought that these graphs, uh, this number should be at most linear. And uh, the reason Erdős thought about this, because if you use just a very, very simple probabilistic method, um, it will show you that, you know, uh, you could expect, you know, the number of edges to be linear. So probabilistically you will get linear. But uh, 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 Dikain and uh, Seke, they disprove this conjecture. And they really construct a graph on so many vertices, uh, with so many edges, and without C4 and C6, when M was of this type. And uh, then with Steven Ken Volder, we uh, could improve the lower bound a little bit. And uh, we used uh, some Q square lifts of induced subgraphs of, uh, of this um, by a fine part of projected queen. It relates to another quadrangle, but it's not without the, it's a biregular quadrangle, there are such. But this, you know, in, in view of this uh, equations, which I wrote, that will be exactly this, and I can write equations precisely. And that produced better lower power. Now, the question is here, narrow the gap. I think for this problem, uh, this upper bound, and lower bounds are too different. That's kind of, you know, C4, C6 forbidden, but the difference is so big in what is known. Um, I would say that uh, this upper bound should be reduced, but uh, I certainly don't know how to do it. The reduced to what, I don't know either. And that's Dominic and that's Lassie. And, uh, and that's all. And thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Felix. Um, if we could all thank Felix in some way. Thank you. Thank you for citing me. Oh, my pleasure. My pleasure. I like this picture. I didn't write, you know, the year you were born. I couldn't find it on the web. So. 65. <laughs> Yeah, so you are a young fellow. All right. Uh, um, does anybody have any questions for Felix? Hey, so I have a little question. Um, this uh, permutation polynomial question, um, What's going on there? I mean, is this, uh, if K does divide Q, is it easy to describe what permutation? That's very, if K divides Q, so K is the power of P because Q is power of P. Yeah. So then when you use uh, Frobenius automorphism, so X will be to the power, say, P, P square or P cube. So that will become trivial. That will become trivial. You see, because this will be x plus one to the, say, suppose k is p, then it will be x plus one to the p. It will be x to the p plus one to the p minus x to the p. And it will be just uh, x to the p times one. And x to the p, that's permutation polynomial. The yeah. same thing square. So it's sort of, in one direction, it's trivial if k divides that. But mm -hmm. if k doesn't divide that, it's, uh, so far, you know, we couldn't do it and spent a lot of time on other people. I try to popularize this problem, especially because it's like function 
monomial times its derivative. But uh, as I say, it's not by design. It's just we try to try to try some functions h and try to make Gersate, and uh, we came to this question. The same with this polynomial. It's not as good looking as this. But there are a million of simple questions, which uh, sometimes, you know, as I say, you forget what you're doing really, and you just want to, like this question, I, I want to see what am I missing here. Uh, are they are so more? You see, a computer is useless here, unfortunately. <laughs> Over finite fields, you just put in the machine and it tells you. But uh, here, how you do it? Over algebraic uh, closed field of characteristic, uh, algebraically closed field of characteristic zero, uh, they are not isomorphic. Complex numbers, in particular. Over rationals, I'm hundred percent sure they are not isomorphic. I didn't try actually, but I'm sure. But of real side, I don't know. See what's very, yeah, okay, I don't want to take more of your time. But with reals, you know, what is interesting that if you take additive group of real numbers, additive group, and you take additive group of two dimensional vector space over real numbers, R2, these groups are isomorphic. These two infinite groups are isomorphic. Just additive group of reals and additive group of uh, uh, two-dimensional vector space of reals. They are isomorphic additive groups. And uh, so I'm not sure what's going on. I'm still here. I can see you, but you cannot see me. <laughs> uh, any other questions for Felix? All right. Um, if not, then uh, thanks again for a uh, for a wonderful talk, and uh, um, I will. I think we'll, we'll end there and, and uh, I'll see everyone else uh, next week. Um, <laughs> Felix, maybe- uh, Thank you, thank you, Stephen, very much. Yeah, uh, what, what did you want to say? Oh, I was gonna say maybe maybe uh, maybe we'll, we'll get a chance to uh, to Zoom chat at some point. Uh, of course. <laughs> so. We'll be very happy. I just want to end one more sentence. I forgot to say that similar equations define directive graphs too. Uh, only if they're not bipartite, you just take vector space and you write this type of equations. And uh, in the references I gave, I think digraphs are much more interesting because digraphs, even with one equation, uh, produce such a variety of non-isomorphic example, much, much greater than, uh, say, bipartite graph with one equation. Only. So uh, I just wanted those who need some interest in digraphs, uh, which appear naturally in this in this uh, setting, you may try. Thank you, sorry. Thank oh, you very thank much. You. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you. Nice to see everyone. Bye-bye. Right. Mm -hmm. Bye. Bye.